Welcome to Benzene Chemistry. In this third episode, we'll see Cori Fox reaction, which is another way to synthesize a terminal alkyne. In the last episode, we saw Cypher Gilbert's reaction, which could also lead to the same product. However, Cori Fox reaction is in two steps and involves an alpha elimination, which we'll see in the first part of the video. Then I picked a literature example that we'll go through, and I prepared the synthesis exercise that we'll work on at the end of the video. In Cori Fox reaction, you start with an aldehyde to which you add triphenylphosphine and carbon tetrabromide. Then you get this dibromoethylene part that you can isolate. And in another reaction, you add butyl lithium and water in two subsequent steps. And then you, you can isolate your terminal alkyne. First of all, triphenylphosphine attacks carbon tetrabromide on one of its bromine atoms. This CBr bond goes to the carbon and creates this carbanion, which is stabilized by the three bromines, which are electron withdrawing. And then you get also this uh, positively charged uh, phosphorus, because you just made a fourth bond, and it, it has five uh, of valence. So your carbanion can now attack the phosphorus, and you get this intermediate. And you release a bromide atom. The second part of the mechanism is when the second equivalent of triphenylphosphine reacts and attacks once again a bromine atom. The two electrons from this sigma bond transfer and create a pi bond between the phosphorus and the carbon, hence stabilizing the, the positive charge on the phosphorus. This second equivalent now has four bonds and is positively charged. And as you notice, we made a bromide ion, which can then attack this phosphorus. And then you get this as a side product and you get to waste it eventually. So now that we've created this double bond, uh, some of you may recognize that this has a resonance form that's called an ilide or elide, which is uh, very similar to what you get in a Wittig reaction or identical. All right, so now that you have your ilide, just like in the Wittig reaction, your negatively charged carbon will attack on the carbonyl. This time it's with an aldehyde. Then you get this molecule, which has a negatively charged oxygen next to a positively charged phosphorus. If it wasn't, it can rotate on this bond. And uh, you will form this phosphorus oxygen bond, which is highly favored thermodynamically. This bond is very strong. And phosphorus is said to be an oxophile, an excellent oxophile. So you get this four-membered cycle, just like in Wittig reaction, and you get this decomposition to create two uh, new pi bonds. This one with your uh, dibromoalkene, and you get to waste triphenylphosphine oxide, which can be a pain to remove from your solution, but uh, that's not our problem now, pushing arrows. For the third and final part of this reaction mechanism, you get to have a lithium halogen exchange. This happens when your dibromoalkene reacts with uh, butyl lithium to uh, exchange one of its bromine atom for a lithium. And this happens, by the way, on the most standard bromine atom, the one on the organic uh, substituent side. And you get this molecule. And now you get to witness an alpha elimination, which is another way to create a carbene. In Seifert Gilbert, we used diazo to create the carbene, and since uh, dinitrogen was such a good leaving group, it left the two electrons and you'd get your carbene. But this time, this lithium carbon bond is basically just a negative charge. And what could you do to solve your problem of having a negative charge on your carbon is to remove one of the bromine atom, which is happy to leave as a bromide ion which will pair up with the lithium and you can remove. So you get once again a carbene. So now, uh, just like in the Cypher Gilbert, you get this migration, the uh, double, the doublet of a non-bonding electron will create a third bond in yellow here and the uh, proton will migrate at the other side of your alkyne. So you get your terminal alkyne. And I went and, and dug up some of the literature on this. 
And I found those references. And this is called a Fritz Buttenberg Weichel. Sorry for uh, buttering those names. Rearrangement. And uh, it's quite documented uh, since uh, 1894. And uh, what actually happens is that the, the hydrogen migrates. And they studied that very uh, thoroughly. So they marked... I found an example where... Uh, in this fourth reference, they marked the carbon with a 13 carbon isotope to uh, do a 13 carbon NMR. And they had this carbene and they witnessed that they had the 3 for 1 ratio um, when they heated it up. So most of the time the hydride, the hydrogen, sorry, will shift rather than the atom phenyl. So this is called a 1 2 hydride shift, and it's the FBW rearrangement. If you guys want to look it up, so I put the reference there. And this is supposed to be an illegal or uh, not allowed move since uh, the Woodward Hoffman rule forbids it. But you guys go look up into it. Carbene are very special in their reactivity, and this is a special care case, sorry, where um, the Woodward Hoffman rule is not respected. So you get to have this terminal alkyne after your hydride shift. Alright, so just before we move on to the literature example, I wanted to talk some more about the alpha elimination. So, um, this is the alpha carbon, the one that has the leaving group on it, and the beta carbon would be the one adjacent to it. So normally you'd get uh, in beta eliminations or just eliminations, you'd get uh, a base would grab this proton and uh, create a pi bond, and then it would eject your uh, your bromide. In the case of a uh, E two elimination, but in this case with your lithium uh, halogen exchange, you get to eliminate on the same carbon that has the negative charge, which is basically this bond. So it, it does not happen from another carbon. It's directly on this carbon. So that's why it's called an alpha elimination. And this happens when you have this lithium halogen exchange. And this is what allowed us to get this carbene with its special reactivity. Cool, cool. Now that we've seen the reaction mechanism, let's jump into the literature example. So this one's a bit old. It's uh, 1993. It's the total synthesis of uh, this natural product, the licorysidine and the plus isomer. So uh, I jumped uh, to a few steps here and uh, they didn't start from that. But um, yeah, they, they came up with this molecule with an aldehyde and a protected side out ether and a bunch of metoxides. They wanted to do the Cori Fox on it. So their first attempt was to do it normally within DCM with the uh, two equivalents of triphenyl phosphine and carbon, and one of carbon tetrabromide. And it ended up not working too well because they cleaved their protected alcohol there, their um, silyl ether. And their hypothesis was that, uh, remember in the second part of the mechanism, I said you'd waste or uh, you'd get this side product and you wanted to waste it somehow. And, and this has a bromide on it, bromine rather. And this could cleave the, the silyl ether. And in the last episode, I talked about the TBAF to deprotect uh, the silyl ethers because the SIF bond is really strong. But SIX, X being allergen, is also really strong. So uh, this molecule could deprotect, at least the, that's what they thought, and their silyl ether. So their thought process, which you can see at this page, was that uh, they needed to try another version. They, they saw that uh, you could do it with zinc and uh, two uh, ZnBr2 rather. And they also got the same problem, uh, the zinc cleaved the cyanide ether. And uh, yeah, in this version you use only one equivalent of triphenyl phosphine because this molecule regenerates your first equivalent. You go and check this out. Uh, so this didn't work. And they tried the second version, which used a third butoxide and one equivalent of the triphenyl phosphine. With this, which I Google, it's bromoform. I, I said fluoroform at first because it's really the same, but with a bromine. Um, yeah, bromoform in toluene. 
It was all right. I think they got decent yields, but it wasn't scalable. They got variable results when they tried to scale it up. So it didn't work. And the last attempt, or what, rather what worked, was that they added a base to it. They have no clue why it worked, but they added a base to it and they got this yield, which uh, gave them this um, dibromo alkene, which what, was what they wanted. And they kept their protected uh, alcohol. Now that they had the dibromo alkene, they wanted to do the second part, but they started by doing it in THF and they added TMEDA because they wanted to make sure that your uh, alkyne was deprotected so you could get your negative charge because the uh, the hydrogen, the terminal hydrogen um, is pretty acidic so that would be the first one that you deprotonate and you could make it attack your uh, trimethylsilyl chloride and eject the chloride to protect your terminal alkyne. So that's what they did, it worked uh, with 81% yield but uh, when they tried it in multigram scales, they ended up eliminating some of the ilmetoxide. The metoxide. So uh, they had to do it in two parts. So they first isolated doing it normally, and um, only exception of adding uh, ammonium chloride, and they got their terminal alkyne with 88% yield. And then they deprotonated their alkyne with butyl lithium again, and it, it attacked the trimethylsilyl chloride. So ended up protecting it. But if you do the math and I got the calculator out, um, 0.88 times 0.85, you get 0.75. So uh, still not as good as 81%, but that's, that's what they got. At least they could make it in a multigram scale. All right, so overall that's it for Curry Fox reaction. They did uh, the first step, they got their dibromo alkene. And then they ended up doing the second step, this yeah, the second part of their Curry Fox reaction in two separate parts, to also include their uh, protected alkyne. And afterwards, just, let's just quickly go through what they did with this. Um, they used Lindler's catalyst, which is this, to do the hydrogenation of their alkyne. And normally, you would, uh, if you didn't use Lindler's, uh, you you could not stop. At the uh, at the alkene, but Lindler uh, allows you to uh, to stop and do, to not hydrogenate uh, the alkene, and also you get this very high selectivity for the cis alkene. So you get this molecule, and uh, afterwards there's a couple reaction. You can go and check it out. They end up with this with the stereochemistry all going accordingly, and they added this part and try it till I'm in, I mean, and then they made this bond and they did the Ogawa procedure for uh, the last cycle here and then they added, ended up with their licoricidine which I'm gonna have to move to show you, okay licoricidine am I still in the way? kind of right this so that's it, let's move on to the synthesis exercise that I prepared. Alright, so for this synthesis exercise, um, I want you guys to reach these final targets using, if possible, uh, the reaction we've seen so far. So Shapiro's reaction, Cypher Gilbert, and Corey Fox. And you can also use any content that I've talked in those videos. Um, so that's the moment where you should pause. I'll leave you guys a few seconds. Hope you did. Hope you did. I'll just minimize myself somewhere. Okay. All right. So let's try the first one. So let's reach A as a, our final target. So uh, I thought of two ways to do this one. Mm, you notice there's a terminal alkyne. Sorry. There's a terminal alkyne, which should give you a big hint. So we just talked about those. So indeed, you can use Corey Fox reaction. Corey Fox. So you do it in two steps. You get your uh, dibromo alkene, and then you add butyl lithium and water to get your terminal alkene. You could also do it if you remembered from episode number two, Cypher Gilbert. Yes, G. 
and you could use the Ohira Bestman reagent and to make sure you do not enolize because you have the nitrogen here. Make sure you don't enolize accidentally and get a dimer or something. Uh, so yeah, you could do that in one step. Okay, just your three methanol. You do your esterification. You break it up. You get your carbene. Then boom, you get your final product. So that's it for A. Let's do B. And by the way, this is a decaline with two uh, hydrogens this way, or a cis decaline. And now you got this with the B. I wrote B twice. Yeah. So you want to do this alkyne, which you see is not terminal, which has two R substituents to it. So that should also ring a bell. Also thought of two ways to do it. You could do it again with Cypher Gilbert. Do it red. Cypher Gilbert. With again the Ohiro Bestman reagent. Or the normal one, because this is a ketone and it's less likely. But I still do it with this if it works because it's much milder condi conditions so you get this in one step once again the same way or you could use uh, this is a bit fancier i don't know why you would not do the cypher gilbert let's say it doesn't work and you want to try every fox for fun and you got time so uh, you could do this so get your uh, dibromo alkene then you get your alkyne doing the same step as I talked before, so butyl lithium and water. You get your terminal alkyne. Then you could deprotonate it. Like we said in the literature example, you can deprotonate the uh, hydrogen at the end of your alkyne because it's acidic. It's an SP hydrogen. So uh, the negative charge is highly stabilized. So it's, it's more acidic than the other ones. And you deprotonate it with terbutyl lithium or something, a base. Then you make it attack and do a, a substitution to kick the chlorine out. Then you can add this part. So uh, I don't know why you do this. I just wanted to do it using curry fox. Curry fox. All right. Now let's move on to uh, these two final exercises. How could you reach those targets using the three reactions we've seen so far? Um, this, these, this time you get alkenes and uh, you get this one that's a trans alkene with a deuterium next to it. And this one a cis alkene with a deuterium. So how would you do this? Pause and try it up. And then I'll propose the synthesis I got. All right. So for C, which was the green path, um, I started with a ketone with these two parts because you want an isopropyl and a methyl. And I did Shapiro's reaction with trisol, which you remember is uh, if you're cheap on the uh, N-butyl lithium, you use trisol because you only need two equivalents. So you make your hydrosome, and now it's an unsymmetrical hydrosome. So if some of you remember, you can check in the reaction control of Shapiro's reaction. You get your trans um, alkene from this. And if you add any electrophile, like I said in Shapiro, you can replace your lithium or your negative charge by this electrophile. So in this case, deuterium. So you get this trans alkene with the deuterium. All right, last but not the least, um, D is a cis alkene, if you consider that uh, D is more important than H. And uh, how would you synthesize that? You might have seen spoilers from the yellow uh, synthesis I proposed, showed up here. So let's start it up. You start with uh, an aldehyde, because I wanted to do Curry Fox reaction. And then you add triphenylphosphine, carbon tetrabromide, you get your dibromo alkene. Then you add butyl lithium, and instead of adding water, you add heavy water. Then you get this deuterium at the end of your terminal alkyne. Afterwards, uh, like we just saw in the literature example, you can use Lindler's catalyst to do hydrogenation. 
and this stops at the alkene. And not only does it stop, you know that the addition of uh, the hydrogen or the two hydrogens that you'll add up are assigned, so on the same side. So that's why you're so sure that you get your deuterium on the same side of your isopropyl. Not sure if it's called cis, but it's this molecule. You got your H's on the same sides here. All right, so that's it for Curry Fox reaction. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, the links are in the description for the references. And I also started including the DOIs. So you guys go and check those out. I'm no absolute truth. So if you've got anything you want to go deeper or clarify, you go and check those references. Thanks for watching. If you got anything to comment, future reactions, or feel free. And if you want to like and subscribe, you do you. Alright, so I'll see you guys in the next one.